Hi everyone, today we are going to talk about legal future and innovations with Isabel Davis, an associate at Media Technology and IP Law from Wigan. Isabel specialized in all areas of interactive entertainment, including video games and esports. Prior to working at Wigan, Isabel worked at boutique video games law firm Burwell Partners and also in-house at Disney Interactive and Kin. And I, moderator of this event, Mikita Zhukov, CEO of, at uh, Zhukov Legal, family office, co-founder of uh, Legal Design Project, chairman of the UBA Committee on Constitutional Law, Administrative Law and Human Rights, and coordinator of Ukrainian Bar Association Young Lawyers Forum. Nice to meet you, Isabel. Before we Love start... Yeah, uh, before we start, could you shortly tell us about your experience in working at Disney Interactive and Keen? What is the firm with an, you know, interesting name and very popular name in our world? And what were your activities at this firm? Sure. So when I, I did law at university and I really wanted to get into the games industry, so I essentially applied for an internship at Disney Interactive in their business development team. So it was essentially working on various different commercial projects um, that Disney's games arm um, was essentially running. So at that time, um, Club Penguin, which was an online world run by Disney, was very, very popular. It was at the height of its popularity. So I did a lot of work around that. And the other thing that was getting pretty big at that point was um, free to play gaming on mobile phones. So, you know, in the early 2010s, people were starting to stop playing on Facebook and move on to their iPhones. So there was a lot to do with the transition of games onto those platforms, which was exciting. And then I started to do some legal work there as well. Uh, King was again a, a very exciting place to work i i left disney after a year to go work at king and king is best known for candy crush saga so again in that early 2010s era they were having a massive amount of success with candy crush um on mobile having moved off um facebook and i was doing a lot more of the legal work there so sitting down and talking with game developers about issues, you know, when developing a game, whether it's uh, consumer rights issues, privacy issues, uh, child protection issues. So much more hands-on with the game products themselves. Um, and then there was uh, a bit of commercial work as well in that role. So dealing with uh, influencers and influencers playing the games, um, sponsorship agreements, and just kind of more general commercial contracts that any business would see whether or not they're a games business. So it was two really interesting roles. And I was very lucky to work in the teams there. And um, a lot of lawyers in the games industry, they tend to start off at law firms and then move in house. Whereas I've done it the other way around. I started off in house and are now working at a law firm. So a little bit, a little bit different um, to most people's paths. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. It it, it was a, a little exciting warm up uh, to our uh, event. Uh, so, in the focus of uh, today event, uh, industry of video games, ways, mainstreams, the role of the law in the industry, law video games as an instrument for increasing legal culture and consciousness. How do they impact legal culture? Who is a future lawyer, and what skills should we have? Is it time to start learning to program? Metaverse and legal profession, only a retail office or something more? Legal tech and future lawyer, do we have to know how to create legal products? So you are welcome, Isabel. You can start with your a short presentation about this topic. Perfect. So yeah, hopefully this will work. I'm just gonna try and share my PowerPoint. Um, my hope is that this will be a brief introduction to a few of these topics that then we can have a talk about afterwards. Um, so just to check, can you see my screen? Yeah, everything is okay. Great, Great. perfect. So yeah, thank you so much for that inf uh, introduction, Makaisa. So just to give a very brief overview again. So we've, I've already talked about my time at Disney and King, so I won't go into that again, but 
yeah, I'm I'm a video games lawyer, interactive entertainment lawyer. Um, this is my 10th year in the games industry, so I'm very lucky to have worked in it for quite some time, um, have seen it progress in a number of ways, which has been really exciting. And video games industry as a whole is a very innovative industry. So I think there is a lot that, you know, we as lawyers can actually learn from this industry and, and, and think about issues going forwards. Um, I'm lucky to work with uh, game studios of lots of different shapes and sizes so some games companies we work for are just one person and they rely on us for everything um, across their legal needs which is which is fun because you don't know what you're going to get on your desk every single day it's it's very varied work and then for some of the very large games companies that we work for that have their own very big legal teams um, you know it, it's they are they are a lot more educated as to the issues but they quite often need a second pair of hands or someone to help them with a particularly difficult issue and I've just stuck my Twitter on the end there because to be honest anyone who's interested in the games industry or um, metaverse or interactive entertainment despite what Elon Musk is doing a lot of us still are on Twitter maybe that will change at some point but that is kind of still the hub of the conversation so that's where to uh, that's where to talk about these issues right now. And then just a tiny bit again about how we work with, so some names you might recognize there. So Epic, you make Fortnite, we're very lucky to work with them. Uh, CD Projekt Red, uh, a very large Polish games company who make The Witcher and, and Cyberpunk games. And then all the way down to some of the indie studios that we work for. So Face Punch are best known for their computer games, uh, Gary's Mod and Rust, which are uh, online games that have been around for a very long time, but are still very successful. And then very briefly about Wigan. So as uh, Makaita said, we are a media and entertainment law firm. So there's the video games practice that I sit in, but we also have a film and TV practice uh, and a gambling practice. And then lots of other complementary teams that sit within the firm. Um, we're just less than 200 people at the firm overall. So we're not a tiny firm, but we're not, we're not a massive firm. So again, just very briefly, what I'm hoping to cover in this PowerPoint um, before we before we discuss, um, it's going to be quite a whistle stop tour through these topics because I think the meat of the uh, the meat of the webinar should be actually getting to talk about these issues. Um, but this is at a broad level what I'm going to try and uh, touch upon. So being a video games lawyer, um, people always say to me when I tell them I'm a video games lawyer, do you get to play video games all day? And the answer is unfortunately no. Um, there are some days where I get to play video games. Um, for example, if I'm looking at a particular uh, IP issue in a video game, or if I'm looking at how a game is monetized, um, you know, for consumer issues, then yes, I actually do get to sit down and sometimes play some games, which is really fun. But a video games lawyer is still a lawyer. And a lot of what we do is what that picture is on the right, which is firefighting a whole bunch of issues. Um, some games companies are very proactive with their legal thinking. A lot of them are not. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fires to be put out. Um, so unfortunately not games all day. But what does a typical games company look like and how do we, and how do we assist them? So this doesn't cover everything, but I always think it's quite useful to actually look at the stages of a games, you know, company project life cycle and, and how we slot in. Um, so for company formation, this is the same as any company, really, any tech company. You know, if you've got a person or a few people that want to make a game studio, then you normally start by creating the company and thinking about how they're going to work together, what staff do they need, um, who the IP is going to be held by, and how they're going to get essentially their company off the ground. And we're lucky that we've been involved with um, some very early games companies and helped kind of watch them grow, which is always really satisfying and then starting development is when the fun kind of starts um, you have to start thinking about kind of what is your game going to be are there any issues that we need to start thinking about from the get-go um, nowadays a lot of the start of the development stage involves thinking about actually kind of privacy and online safety issues and actually trying to build some safety mechanisms into the products themselves so it's really fun and exciting to sit down with games developers and actually talk to them about these issues, much like how I did at King back in the day. Um, but now at a law firm, I get to do it with a whole bunch of games companies, which is really nice. Funding is always a fun one. Um, a lot of games companies 
will get the majority of their funding uh, via a publisher. So a developer develops the game and then a separate third party will go out and publish that video game. Um, and normally the publisher will give some funding to the developer to help them make the game and quite often to market the game as well. But that's not the only way you can get funding. Um, again, like with other companies, tech companies, you could get equity funding, you could do debt funding, and we try and help um, games companies navigate that essentially to work out a what might be what might work best for them and how do we paper that up in a in a good way further development this is a bit of a catch-all bucket for just issues that crop up later in development um, i had quite an interesting one recently of a games company asking if they could use uh some buildings from real life in their game um from various different countries and again that threw up quite a few interesting copyright issues because in some countries some buildings do have uh, IP rights in them, so you can't necessarily just put them straight into the game with no license. So that was interesting. We also had uh, a games company recently want to license in a particular famous piece of music. Um, so we had to speak to our music team about that because, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone here is a music law uh, knowledge, uh, someone with knowledge of music law, but music law is very complicated in the UK. So I do not touch that at all if I can avoid it. Pre-launch, these are things like trademarks, getting the game cleared, making sure it's all legally sound. Um, you know, another classic one pre-launch is thinking about uh, consumer legal documents like your terms of service and your privacy policy um, and your code of conduct. And, you know, essentially how, how do you want your relationship with your players to be mapped out? What's important to the games developer to get right at this stage? And then the last one, we don't often like to talk about this because hopefully uh, when you make a game, you don't think about, you know, essentially ending it, but thinking about how you sunset a game and what's fair for consumers, you know, do you need to give them a refund? Do they need some time before the game is shut down? Um, it's something that we advise on as well. So I think that gives a very kind of broad overview of, you know, different issues at different stages of a game's life cycle and, and what it can be like day to day. And I guess to kind of summarize in a final few points, um, I touched upon this point at the start, but depending on the size of the games company, our role is a bit different. Um, for a very small games company, they kind of see us as their external general counsel. So essentially you're the one lawyer that they go to everything to. They, everything goes through you, whether it's a commercial issue or an IP issue or a data protection issue, um, and you help with that. So that's really fun because the work can be very diverse um, and very different. And then versus industry expert kind of role, which is where a, a company with a big legal team have a very specific issue that they want advice on because they come to you as someone who they think is the industry expert. So that kind of that and that tends to involve, you know, writing long memos on a specific issue and and kind of weighing up the different arguments um, either way. So that's again really interesting and. Quite often you're dealing with legal questions that might not have been answered before, which is always really exciting. Um, as I said, whole variety of issues. Um, I guess I would describe myself as a an industry specialist, so a, a video games law specialist, if although such a thing doesn't fully exist, rather than a uh, you know a legal specialist. So I don't describe myself as a data protection lawyer, but I know a lot about data protection as it applies to games. Um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting position to be in because you have your fingers in a few legal topics, but I only ever do work on interactive entertainment and video games. So that's how I kind of gather my knowledge together in a sense. And it's a fast moving industry. Um, one of the reasons that I've been very happy to stay in the game space is, I mean, I do love games. Uh, more generally, I'm a gamer, but I think it's just such an exciting space to be in and um, I mean, we'll talk about the metaverse a little bit later on, but video games are really at the forefront of building kind of online worlds and online communities. And I think that's always really interesting uh, work and it brings up a lot of interesting in issues. So, and I expect over the next 10 to 20 years, uh, you know, technology as a whole is only becoming more regulated. Um, you look at how regulators are responding to, you know, the big social media and tech giants, there's a lot more, um, a lot more laws coming for those kind of big players, and that and that does trickle down to the likes of video games. So 
there's a lot of uh, a lot of content to protect to, to to tackle essentially so on to the second one so video games and legal culture i was really having a think about this one because i think when Mikita and i discussed it originally it actually did make me think about how you know how can video games impact legal culture and to what extent has you know, legal culture being represented in video games um, informed me of my own career or informed others of their own career. And it's actually interesting because I was thinking about who the lawyers in video games are and they are actually much less than they used to be. Um, I, I remember growing up and playing the Ace Attorney games on my Game Boy. Uh, Phoenix right on the left here is probably the most well-known games lawyer. And I think, although it takes a lot of uh, creative license, I think it's a very, very fun way of exploring uh, the dynamics of going to trial, of gathering evidence, um, and in a sense of working with colleagues. So it's really exciting. Um, my first lawyer in a video game that I came across was Ken Rosenberg in the middle, who's from, from Grand Theft Auto Vice City, um, who's a horrible example of a lawyer. He's, he's not trustworthy. He doesn't have any integrity. Um, He's a drug addict. It's just all the things you probably wouldn't want your lawyer to be. And yet he's one of the earliest memories I have of someone being a lawyer in a video game, which I think is quite funny, all things considered. Um, the chap on the left, uh, uh, Yagami, he is the protagonist from Judgment, which is one of the more recent Yakuza games, which I thoroughly would recommend as a, a video game series. Um, he is an ex-lawyer turned private detective, but that series of games is very much bedded in legal and corruption scandals. Um, and, and as I said, it's one of the few recent examples I can actually find of the get a lawyer in games. So I think actually, did 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 lawyers and video games impact me with my with my career going up? Possibly. My earliest memory of gaming full stop is uh, watching my dad play Tomb Raider in the early 2000s. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a lawyer in games, but I think it is interesting. Um, the headline on the right that I put on the slide there is an article that I was interviewed for a couple of years ago um, around the most recent Ace Attorney game, um, which was set in Victorian England. Um, and it was such a fun article to do because it basically meant that I had to play the most recent uh, Great Ace Attorney Chronicles and actually assess how accurate it was. Um, so that was a, a really fun interview to do, probably one of the funnest interviews I've done in my, my whole career, actually. But again, goes to show that you can use games to essentially push legal culture forward, I think, in an interesting way. Other professions that have popped up in games as well, I think, have increased. So although lawyers, I think, in the early 2000s and the mid-2000s were in games more, there's been other games more recently that have dipped into similar themes, but not legal exactly. So on the right is Smith & Smithson's accounting game. Um, it's a very loopy game. Um, it starts off with two accountants doing a sort of training experiment. Um, it very quickly goes uh, rapidly downhill, but it's um, it's a great example of a game that is kind of playing on those kind of professions. And then the two games by Lucas Pope on the right there, Return of Oberdin and Papers, Please, they are from the perspective of an, of an insurance investigator and a border control um, monitor um, in each each game. So again, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting twist on games to look at these roles that you would think why would I want to play a game about an insurance investigator? But he makes it compelling and interesting. And I think there's a lot, um, a lot more that actually could be done in the in the game space in terms of looking at careers that might not make a natural game, um, rather than just making action games. But maybe that's just me. So on to the next topic, legal innovation in the future lawyer. So I think actually it helps probably talking a bit about Wigan's approach there here. So Wigan is very keen on generally innovating and everyone at the firm uh, bringing ideas forward for stuff that they think is a good idea for the firm to be doing. So um, the screenshots that I've put there are essentially all Wigan related businesses. So they are, they are all businesses that someone at Wigan has set up that Wigan has supported. Um, and they are either kind of media and entertainment um, focused or legal tech focused. So uh, for example, Viewfinder at the bottom is a Wigan film production house. So we find films that we want to fund and we fund them. Uh, Reviewed and Cleared is um, 
essentially if you've got a film that you need to actually do ip clearance for then we've got a dedicated team for that uh i'll probably our probably most successful company is inca pro in the middle there which uh sold to core search a couple of years ago which specialized in essentially ip counterfeiting solutions so it's a, it's a legal tech solution um and that was set up probably ooh, at least 10 years ago now so it's something that wigan has been thinking about for a long time um we also won a legal technology award last year what came became runner up for our uh, recent tax manager ir35 as well so i think when we talk about the future lawyer it is really important i think individually to be aware of issues in your job and how you think they could be modernized and helped but for me personally it's been really really valuable having a firm that actually supports these kinds of initiatives and whether you're you know one of the most senior persons at the firm or you're one of the most junior persons at the firm um they really will take your idea seriously and they will you know give it due airspace um so i think it is important to to think about innovation because ultimately we want to make our, our own lives easier but the ultimate goal obviously is to make clients lives easier so i think future lawyer is someone that is thinking about um legal tech and innovation and as I mentioned at the very start of the presentation games businesses are innovators as well and i think that does rub off on us in the interactive entertainment team. Uh, my old team at King uh, won a legal tech award uh, at the end of last year um, for their, uh, basically their very, very novel privacy policy. Um, I'd really recommend looking at it on your mobile phone because um, that's how it's kind of designed to be, but it's, um, it's really, really nicely done. And they try and essentially make what could be a very, very boring document, um, exciting or at least interesting for a, a normal user. Um, and the legal tech company that they partnered with, uh, Amarubi, who are based in France, um, won the award with King as well. So that was really lovely to see. And then some examples on the right of some interesting um, projects that games businesses are thinking about in terms of dealing with essentially legal or uh, similar issues. So two of, the biggest games two of the biggest games companies in the world, Ubisoft and Riot Games, are working together to combat uh, toxic chats in games. So and I think they're predominantly doing that through AI and machine learning. So I think, and I think this is not, they are not the only games companies that are looking at this issue. So they are clearly trying to not only make their games a nicer place to be, but they are also helping their own support team to try and actually take some of the effort off them as well. I think the, the cabined accounts that Epic have brought in recently is also very interesting essentially allows you to play games like Fortnite that would otherwise normally require data to be processed in order to use a multiplayer game. They've managed to kind of pack it right down so that users can essentially have the same game experience with very little privacy um, considerations, which I think is incredibly clever. And then the last one is just something recently that I spotted in the press about a recent fundraise for Playstream, uh, thinking about AI generated live stream content. So essentially being able to look at various video games, live streams online and essentially pass together all the best bits to release as highlights. If someone can speed that process up, then I'm sure a lot of YouTubers out there would be very, very happy. So the final one, Metaverse and the legal profession. Um, I'm sorry, that, that picture is actually quite creepy, but um, I, think it's, I think it proves it quite well. So I think very briefly, what is the Metaverse? I think this is something that actually, um, I think I think a lot of people are still struggling to kind of get a grip of, of what exactly it is. I don't think there's any one right answer, but it's something that is popping up as a buzzword a lot in my line of work um, currently. And I think there's a lot of different words that I've thrown down there, but I think the decentralized one is actually really interesting. So should the metaverse be something that is not centrally controlled, whether by a government or a company, or should it be totally openly ran? Um, if you speak to some people, they would say the metaverse has to be decentralized to be a metaverse. Um, a lot of other people think that it ultimately will not be like that. I think I fall into the latter camp because if you look at all the metaverse developments currently, most of them are being done by, you know, very large tech game social media companies. They are ultimately going to have some level of control over their spaces. Whether or not they're going to become interoperable, which is one of my other points, is another question. The interoperability point is again an interesting one. I think if we end up with several different metaverses or online worlds, if there is a way for them to tie together and for users to move freely throughout them, I think that's pretty much the second best situation we can be at. Um, 
the, uh, the Metaverse Standards Forum is actually a really interesting group to follow because they've probably got, I think, several hundred tech and games companies all signed up to this Standards Forum with the goal of essentially making an interoperable metaverse. So I'm interested to see the work that that forum does and to see how they essentially push that forward um, over the next several years in particular. And then bandwidth, I've put as a question mark at the bottom. Um, and I think accessibility is actually a big a big issue when it comes to the metaverse. Um, as you know, now, you know, access to smartphones and, and fast internet in the West is, is pretty good, but there's a lot of countries in the world that do not have access to decent internet, do not have access to smartphones. And that means a potentially big problem from an accessibility perspective for the metaverse. So that's something that I think we will have to tackle. And then on the final slide, why the metaverse? So one of the reasons that uh, Mikita and I first started talking was after an article I did last autumn about why law firms should be investing in the metaverse, which is quite a broad title to be fair, but my kind of broad strokes for this article was law firms need to be thinking about it, not from just a client perspective, but also from them as a business, as a law firm. Um, and I'm not necessarily pushing any particular one metaverse either, but I think some of the ideas and themes that it brings to the tables could be really interesting for law firms. So leveraging the blockchain potentially for contract storage or metaverse spaces for remote meetings could, you know, add an element to law firm business that isn't currently there. I think there is a huge amount of downside still um, to the metaverse for law firms in particular, because Ultimately, we have a responsibility to our clients and a responsibility to our regulators and a responsibility to our profession to make sure that everything is done properly and above board. And I've certainly heard of people talking about issues on things like client due diligence. How do you do client due diligence effectively for someone that you've met in the metaverse? Not entirely easy. What happens to concepts like client attorney privilege in the metaverse? You know, it's very easy to mark a document privileged on email or in a letter. Um, as we do currently, but how would that work in a metaverse space? It potentially, potentially more difficult if it's more fluid. And then, of course, there's the changing nature of the market. Um, obviously, with the FTX crypto exchange crashing um, back in the last year, that threw a lot of different blockchains and metaverses into flux. And I think there is, quite rightly, some hesitance by the legal profession to really back any particular one space. But I think, personally, for me, my main interest in it is working out can blockchain technology be used in a way that helps um, helps the legal profession? Um, and ultimately, how are clients interacting with these issues? Um, as I said, games companies are looking at the metaverse, at blockchain, at NFTs, and thinking about different ways that these can be used. So it's important for any kind of, again, future lawyer to think about um, how these things might pan out in the next five to 10 years. So that's my slide. I hope that's given like a very quick overview of a number of topics here. Um, hopefully I can stop sharing this now. Um, yeah, it was great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, very, very interesting information. Uh, and uh, uh, in your presentation, you use uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter link to your mm -hmm. account. Is it important? Is it important uh, for 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 lawyer uh, to use uh, Twitter uh, if um, if uh, this lawyer you know, would like to build a personal brand? Yeah, I mean, as I said, with Elon Musk taking over, it's obviously a bit more of a volatile place than it used to be. But I still certainly find that most of the games industry, whether it's lawyers or non-lawyers, are, are still on there and. I mean, even just probably looking quick look through my profile, you see that like a lot of the stuff I talk about is related to legal and games, etc. Um, I do think building a personal brand can be done in multiple ways. I certainly have found Twitter to be useful over the years. Um, mm -hmm. When I moved from King to my first private practice uh, job at a law firm, I actually met my boss through Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. He was a very well-known games lawyer on Twitter and someone that I really looked up to. And I messaged him on Twitter and I said, you know, can we go for a coffee? We went for a coffee and then, you know, within like two months, I basically had managed to ha get a job there. But I would probably not have been able to reach out to him so easily had it not been for having some chats on Twitter about various issues. Because um, he was tweeting about legal issues in the game space and I was, you know, chipping in on that. So, you know, I think there is certainly something to be said about 
it being a space to network and build your brand. Um, it's not the be all and end all. Like I definitely do not tweet as much as I used to, you know, back in my early twenties, but um, you know, life is busier now, but I do still, I don't think I could ever get rid of it unless I felt there was a good alternative. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because in Ukraine, in legal field, we use only Facebook, uh, mm. LinkedIn, uh, but we we don't use uh, uh, Twitter to legal to 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 build some legal communication. Mm. It, yeah, it's it's really interesting instrument. LinkedIn is my other probably major one to be honest, particularly on the lawyer front. Um, so I think LinkedIn is a great place to to meet people as well. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, am I understand correctly? If we uh, talk about uh, skills, mm. uh, video games uh, lawyer and uh, lawyer and startup lawyer uh, mm. have some similarities uh, in, mm. in skills. Yeah, is is it true? Yeah. yeah, I definitely would say that. I mean, it depends on the startup ultimately. But we, when I have conversations with lawyers that specialize in technology startups there was a lot of common themes because ultimately video games is a combination of, I'd say the creative skills and the mm -hmm. technology skills. It's really a meeting of code and art in a lot of ways. So I, spilt, I speak to film and TV lawyers and they understand video games more as a piece of art. Whereas I speak to tech lawyers and they understand video games more as a piece of tech. So it's quite an interesting middle ground, but certainly in the early stages of company formation, um, you get a lot of the same questions that a technology lawyer would um, when thinking about setting up the company and who you want working for the company and 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 how you incentivize them. So, yeah, certainly a lot of overlap. And I know um, lawyers that have been in games companies that have gone over to tech quite easily and also vice versa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. In your opinion, can AI replace a lawyer? Is <laughs> it possible in the future? <laughs> Ooh, do my self out of a job <laughs> um i probably would have said no and then chat gpt happened and i thought oh my goodness this tool can actually write a contract quite effectively um i think for some of the more manual elements of our job it could definitely be taken over by ai i, I was reading um a legal tech blog a few weeks ago and they were developing there was a firm that's developing an ai that it can essentially process massive amounts of data very, very quickly, um, predominantly for the purposes of due diligence. So when you look at a contract, you know, looking for a clause that says, if the company is acquired, I can terminate the contract, normally referred to as a change of control clause. A, instead of, a, you know, a trainee manually going through all contracts, it can just load all the contracts in and, and make the um, and make the assessment for you in like, you know, two minutes or something. So mm -hmm. I certainly think that my in terms of AI replacing lawyers for things like, you know, people going on trial and actually building arguments for trial, I, I do think there's a massive human element to that, particularly when you're talking to juries. And I do wonder if that kind of human element and building an argument in a way that appeals emotionally, will, will, will a lawyer ever be totally AI or Android or have no human intervention? Difficult to say. I don't think possibly mm -hmm. in my lifetime, but I'm never going to say never because I think a lot of things have happened that probably many people wouldn't have expected. So who yeah, knows? Yeah, hopefully, to... hopefully not in my lifetime because I would like to keep my job. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I am totally agree with you, especially yeah. if we talk about courts, trial. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so in what uh, legal technology do you believe? Maybe automation of drawing up contracts or some mm. analytical system or something more? Yeah, I think, I think that, I mean, when I was talking about the, the King privacy saga, I think that's such a nice legal tech product because the agency that King worked with basically specialized in making essentially horrible legal documents more accessible for consumers. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily thinking about automation or learning or making things, or making things quicker. It's actually taking a step back from that and going, but is this actually improving what the consumer sees and how they interact with your product. Um, so I'm a big believer in legal tech that um, seeks to make things, you know, easier for consumers to understand whether it's you know their rights or um, how they interact with the product. Um, certainly at um, Wigan, a lot of the legal tech startups that we've done, I guess, are from the mindset of 
how do we make our own jobs easier or like you know is there something that day to day we come up against that is actually a really big annoyance or it's taking way longer than it should and how do we how do we work around that um so i think there's there's different ways to look at it in in terms of what problems you're looking to solve but i think i think one of the key takeaways from this talk is that i think thinking about legal tech and and being a future lawyer is actually a really really valuable skill in this day and age particularly if, if you're in a an area of law that um is very innovative because it's almost assumed i think in, in some aspects Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what's yeah, your okay. what's your take on it are you are you legal tech what's your what's your poison yeah uh to my mind i i totally believe in mm -hmm. uh ai I, I believe in some uh analytical technology especially mm -hmm. in uh in, in contracting in uh in trial in courts mm -hmm. and i believe in automotive drawing up contracts uh, mm -hmm. to simplify uh to simplify drawing up and signing mm -hmm. uh contract especially if we talk about uh, uh you know like domestic contract between mm -hmm. uh, two 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 ordinary uh c citizens mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely uh, how how do you feel uh, legal transformation in uh, uh, in Great Britain? Um, I think on the whole, the UK, the UK I think is quite forward looking in the sense that I think our law society is quite good at recognizing where there's an issue and, and trying to deal with it. So I think when e-signatures first came out, the law mm -hmm. society were very quick to um essentially draw the lines between what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable and as a practicing lawyer in the jurisdiction that's really helpful because a lot of people suddenly want to start using a technology and you go oh can we even use this um and certainly now if we do um for example contracts in a jurisdiction like china getting mm -hmm. it wet signed with a stamp and another company stamp is is so arduous that i am very thankful that there is um a fairly forward-looking um a fairly forward-looking law society in this jurisdiction um and i think the uk is in quite an interesting position i guess now because first of all because we have a very big uh we've got quite a big tech hub in in the uk generally so there will always nearly always be a kind of tech um a tech and legal overlap the other thing we do a lot of in the UK is financial services. So accountants and auditors and the like have historically had a very good angle on tech and how tech should develop. And I think that is slowly starting to be more uh, expected in the legal profession in the UK. I think it's rubbing off on us as a profession, which is good. Um, I think, to be quite frank, the UK has obviously wasted a lot of time in the last five years with Brexit. That has slowed us down um which is a big shame but i think um there's hopefully more that we can at least do now that we are out but who knows i don't have a whole huge amount of enthusiasm on that uh, on that topic mm -hmm. okay uh, presently is it possible to uh, to pay uh, to pay using crypto uh, in uh, some contracts or in some relationships uh, between uh, clients and between lawyer yeah so Certainly as, a, certainly as a law firm at Wigan, we don't accept crypto currently, I don't think, mm -hmm. just because of the instability of various currencies. It would you, you could agree a price and then the next day it'd be, I mean, it'd be great if it went up, but if it went down, that would be, that would be less good. Um, there are some firms I think have started accepting crypto in the UK there, although it is a very small number. I think it's only a couple. In terms of between, uh, between clients though, yes, absolutely. Um, We've done a few contracts recently around yeah, metaverse and blockchain. And mm. although there hasn't been any contracts that we've done that have been entirely in crypto, we've done some contracts where there's been part um, in you know, US dollars or GBP or Euro, and then part of it in crypto. Um, because I guess the, the kind of benefit of doing it half and half is you get some stability with doing it mm -hmm. in a fiat currency, but you also get the benefit potentially of the value of the cryptocurrency skyrocketing in the, the second half that you have. So, yeah, and I think um, for the couple of contracts that we've, for the contracts that we've done in this area, um, they've basically, they've tried to essentially uh, kind of 
put the price in to the crypto at the very beginning. It doesn't always happen, but they say, you know, we want X amount of cryptocurrency to equal $20 million or whatever. And you have to give us as much as that crypto as reaches that amount as to try and, I guess, have a bit of a safety net. It doesn't always work, particularly if the cryptocurrency is worth basically nothing, but fingers crossed. But that's how clients, I think, uh, a lot of them are getting around that issue at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you already used uh, virtual offices? So I virtual offices. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you yeah. already used it? Yeah, so I think that's one thing I talk about in um, the Legal Futures article at the end. So we have not yet. There was one law firm that set up an office in Decentraland, which is one of the big kind of um, mm -hmm. metaverses. But I think for us, I think, to be honest, since post-COVID, we found so much use in Teams and Zoom, et cetera, that we almost haven't felt the need to go any further than that. And I think ultimately, like I was saying earlier, there is a lot of instability at the market at the moment. So I think, and I think, for example, Decentraland, on its, when it started, it was setting up, um, it was selling virtual land for like 50,000 euros or more, I think, for even like a small patch of land. And I think ultimately, the firm didn't get to a point where it felt comfortable enough saying this is going to be the future of all virtual offices, this particular piece of virtual land. So not yet, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what should be the lawyer of the future? Maybe it's time for us to start learning to program or to create uh, startups. What do you think about it? Yeah. So I've got actually quite a couple of, quite a few colleagues that know how to code. Um, they do it in their spare time. They make apps, et cetera. I, I know very little bit of code myself. I did the um, Unity, which is one of the games engines that um, a lot of games developers use, has a really good and accessible tutorial um, about learning how to basically code in their engine. So I've done some, I've done some work in that. I'm also in the quite fortunate position that my uh, my long term partner is a software engineer, so I have a bit of a cheat code there. In that, if I have any, you know, question deep quite technical questions, I can kind of get quite lucky and ask him. Um, but mm -hmm. I do think there is something to be said about understanding coding and like having done it a bit yourself. Like as I said, I don't profess to be a coder. I don't know all the ins and outs about it, but actually getting down and actually writing some of your own source code, I think is quite exciting and interesting and certainly when it's come to dealing with issues around code and like things like open source licenses and stuff like that, it's, it's useful to have a bit of background, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Isabel, uh, for your participation in this uh, great event. It, it was, it, it was really, really interesting uh, to hear you and uh, it's, 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 it's the best uh, presentation for today and very interesting information uh, which you share with us, uh, with uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, legal community and I hope with world uh, legal community. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to end up this, uh, this event. Yeah, it was great and uh, see you soon. No, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.